Well, hello there, and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload geared specifically towards you, especially if you live in St. Paul and suburbs and you pay attention to the St. Paul Winter Carnival. Yes, it it's the end of February, February 22nd as we record this, and that means the Winter Carnival has come to a close. It was another fabulous uh, sh uh, time this year. Uh, before, of course, we get into that, we have to go right to our Prager University segment, which, of course, because it's the car Winter Carnival, it's all about happiness. So here's Dennis Prager. Why be happy? Most people think of happiness as essentially a selfish issue. I want to be happy, and I want to be happy for me. I'd like to suggest that, in fact, happiness is far, far more than a selfish desire. In fact, it is a moral obligation. I know that most people have never thought of happiness in this way. Neither did I, to tell the truth, for much of my life. I thought that happiness, and especially the pursuit of happiness, was all about oneself. But it isn't. Whether or not you're happy, and most importantly, whether or not you act happy, is about altruism, not selfishness, because it is about how we affect others' lives. And that's what makes it a moral issue. Ask anybody who was raised by an unhappy parent whether or not happiness is a moral issue, and I assure you the answer will be yes. It is no fun being raised by an unhappy parent, or being married to an unhappy person, or being the parent of an unhappy child, or working with an unhappy co-worker. Our happiness affects others profoundly. That's why happiness is a moral obligation. We are morally obligated to at least act as happy as possible, even if we don't feel happy. People can't be guided by feelings because it is how we act that affects others, not how we feel. A good analogy to bad moods is bad breath. Why do we brush our teeth multiple times every day? It's not only because of hygiene, it's because we want to present good breath to anybody who we come into contact with. Well, the same thing holds true for our moods. A bad mood should be regarded exactly as we regard bad breath. Why are you inflicting it on me, or why am I inflicting it on you? It's just not right. That's why one should endeavor as much as possible to act as happy as possible as often as possible. And just about anyone can do this. No matter how unhappy you may feel at any given moment, you can and have to make a decision on how to act. We may not be free to control whether we feel sad or happy, but we are free to control whether or not we present a happy countenance to others. That doesn't mean we don't share how we feel with our best friends, including hopefully our spouse. Of course we can, and without overdoing it, we should. You know, I, I'm really sad. I had this problem at work today. I have this problem with my marriage. I have this problem with my kid. I have this problem with my parents. But you don't inflict a bad mood on anybody. That's a different thing altogether. We all have the capacity to control how we express ourselves, no matter how we feel. I can prove it. Imagine someone who is just acting miserably to his or her spouse when somebody comes to the door. Have you ever noticed how nicely such a person will treat the stranger? How were they able in a split second to go from inflicting their awful mood on their spouse to acting beautifully toward the stranger who's at the door? Obviously, we can control our moods. Or how about this? Let's say you are chronically in a bad mood and I offered you $10,000 a week not to be in a bad mood. Do you think this would affect your ability to be in a good mood? I suspect so. And to be honest, we even have the power to affect how we feel, not only how we act. Abraham Lincoln famously said that we are as happy as we decide to be. That is exactly what we should decide. Being happier is good for us, and it is what we owe everybody who is in our lives. Becoming happier is another great benefit of acting happy. The happier we act, the happier we will feel. We think that our actions are determined by our feelings, but we have the power to achieve the opposite, 
to shape our feelings by our actions. How we act influences our feelings more than our feelings should ever be allowed to influence our behavior. So yes, indeed, we do have a moral obligation to be, or at least to act, happy. The happy make the world better, and the unhappy make it worse. Happiness is a huge issue. Lincoln was right, we are as happy as we decide to be. And it's time to make that decision. I'm Dennis Prager. Jo and are you happy? Yes, you can control your mood. You control whether or not you are happy. And I'll tell you this, St. Paul Winter Carnival, $10,000. Hmm, sounds like a medallion hunt to me. Um, so maybe just finding a medallion might actually make you happy, at least for a little while. Uh, but we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But right now we're going to look a little bit back at the history of the St. Paul Winter Carnival. This is courtesy of the Minnesota Historical Society. Hi. You know, when the weather gets like this in some parts of the country, folks hole up and they don't come out again till spring. But not here in St. Paul. Here we celebrate winter. It's called the St. Paul Winter Carnival, and we've been doing it for over 100 years. From grueling dog sled races to magical ice palaces under siege, carnival activities have enlivened the long, cold season and brought residents and visitors outside to enjoy the frigid charms of Minnesota in winter. The Minnesota Historical Society has documented the carnival from its earliest days compiling a fascinating mix of items showing how this event has evolved over the years. Photograph and visual collections document the succession of ice palaces, as well as the various organizations whose costumes and trappings add color to the many parades and ceremonies. Here also are portraits of carnival royalty and examples of advertising posters and flyers. The Historical Society's manuscript holdings contain some interesting descriptions of winter carnival activities from participants. Among these are the diaries of Michael J. Boyle. Boyle, the son of Irish immigrants, was born in Pennsylvania in 1856, and after working some years as a surveyor, he moved to St. Paul in the 1870s, where he went to work as a clerk in a dry goods firm of Auerbach, Finch, Culbertson & Company. Among his many social activities, Mr. Boyle was a member of the Nushka Club, a lively group of men and women who spent the winter days tobogganing and the evenings partying. Not surprisingly, the Nushkas were avid participants in the early years of the Winter Carnival. In his diary entry for January 20, 1887, Boyle describes some of the highlights. Tonight, the King of Fire invested the dwelling place of Borealis with a large invading force. The attack was a savage one, but His Fiery Majesty was finally repulsed. The Nushkas were assigned to the defense, and we had as our guests the Makwa Toboggan Club of Minneapolis. Being under the walls, we could see but little of the pyrotechnic display. The action and din of the mini battle was quite exciting. We entertained the Makwas at Grohl's after the storming a sandwich and beer lunch, supplemented by songs and speeches. There was much hilarity and expression of good fellowship. We escorted them to the depot about 11 o'clock. An hour later, I took myself away from a crowd at the Ryan, who were evidently bent on making a night of it. Boyle noted in his entry for the following day that these activities had taken something of a toll on his work life. My record for punctuality, he noted, has been a bad one this week. The Ice Palace was a central feature of early carnivals. Even when melting, the structures attracted public attention. Insurance and financial issues took them out of the picture for much of the 20th century, but they enjoyed a glorious, if brief, revival towards the end of the past century with appearances at Lake Phelan, Harriet Island, and downtown. Parades are the one feature of the carnival that has endured since its earliest days. 
The Society's collections include examples of many marching uniforms from the various clubs and business-sponsored marching groups that participated over the years, adding much to the color of the event. This fleece cardigan style jacket was worn as part of the Riverview Commercial Club group in 1937. This winter carnival uniform of royal blue was part of the Empire Bank group worn by Russell H. Johnson in 1940. This is a classic Hudson Bay blanket type uniform with a great northern marching group patch that was worn by Louis Hill himself, one of the founders of the carnival in the year 1917. In the 20th century, both amateur and professional filmmakers documented the carnival, including this early Kodachrome film made for the Great Northern Railway in 1942. The event was held on an unusually warm day, but the parade already reflects America's entry into World War II with its floats and military marching units. These are just a few examples, the tip of the ice palace, if you will, of the Minnesota Historical Society's Winter Carnival collections. I'm Hamp Smith, reference librarian, Minnesota Historical Society Library. Now, I actually find it quite funny to see the ice palaces of years gone by and compare that with the ice palaces of today. You know, I hear people talk, oh, this is such a big ice palace. It's so big and so beautiful. And yet I look back to the, what was it, 1887, and this thing was huge. We don't make them like that anymore. And no, what we do today, I mean, they may be more elegant than they were back then, but they're much tinier. Uh, I'm just amazed when I look at, at, the, uh, at the video we just saw and just to see just how much they had packaged this and it, it was incredible. Uh, and again, I'm just amazed at the size and grandeur of the ice castles of years gone by. Uh, they were probably not cheap to make then either, and I only want to shudder at the kind of expense. But the one thing that was not mentioned on that video was the St. Paul Pioneer Press Treasure Hunt Medallion. That's a big part of the carnival, especially being on this side of the river. And so we're going to show you right now a uh, brief clip on uh, one of the past finders of the medallion. Let's take a look. Well, what is a treasure hunt without a map? I'm Steve Worthman. I wrote the Treasure Hunter's Guide. It's the only book that's been written for the treasure hunt to help the treasure hunters find the right park. There's 70 parks in here. Countless others that are just insignificant uh, as far as where I would think that the treasure would be hidden. I went out around all the parks with my pencil and paper and it's aerial photography that I got off the internet. I just marked down where every tree was, where every important sign was, where all the picnic tables were, grills, what was in view if I stood around and then looked in a circle. And I would have to walk literally from tree to tree, bench to bench, picnic table to picnic table to make sure that I got everything. I was pretty much a stickler for detail. And what I came up with took three, four years to compile. 1992's hunt was up at Cherokee. It must have gone 10 clues. I never once got to the right park. I blamed it on my not knowing what was in all the parks in the city. My way of taking care of that frustration was to try to compile as many maps of the parks as I could. The writer at the paper, she asked me if I'd ever found it. As well as people on the radio, they asked me, have you ever found it? And of course, that's the toughest answer for me to give. Actually, up to this point, I haven't. But I've gotten really close. Anybody who goes to look for the treasure better have it with them. It does cover basically all the ground where there is a potential realistically to hide the thing. I couldn't believe how many people are carrying them around. I don't know how many he sold, but it had to be a boatload. Like a lot of treasure hunters, their spouses think they're crazy. I guess it's sort of like being a non-Trekkie at a Trekkie convention. I'm not in on the joke. I have no desire to go outside, to get bundled up, to dig. Steve was um, born and raised on the other side of the river in Minneapolis. I used to tease her. I'd say things like, will I understand how you guys talk? Steve did not have an appreciation for being a St. Paulite. I converted. I came over here. No one in the family treasure hunted. Of course, I didn't understand it. 
just like the people in Minneapolis don't understand it. I don't understand why when I, I want to crawl in bed and watch home and garden television, he wants to go out to Walmart and buy a lantern at 1030 at night. I basically said this is a silly idea. Nobody will buy this book. However, every year when I get a phone call, she kind of has to bite her tongue. It started out being a little local community paper. Then he got a call from the local country western station. Second year, he was in the Pioneer Press. KQ's going to interview me tomorrow. That's like the you biggest know? listening audience in the Twin Cities. I don't see myself as a celebrity, but it's pretty wild, isn't it? It's like a better mousetrap. Oh, I still don't believe it, quite frankly. I will never hunt. Steve, I, I would be willing to bet, is in bed next to his wife sleeping right now. And if I find it tonight, Steve will not get it cut. I want the fame and the glory. I want to be able to walk into McGovern's next year and say, you know what, I found it last year. I want everybody to say, hey, there's Jake. He's the guy that found it last year. It's a big weight on my shoulders never having found this. I'm only 22 years old. I want it bad. And every hunt gone is an opportunity gone. It's a personal quest. It's something a lot of people want. Well, I want to be the one someday. He knows more about the history than I do. Everybody dreams about finding the treasure. You're sick, though, when you're dreaming that in July. He calls me in June. To call yourself a serious hunter, you need to be able to leave work. I was willing to not get this promotion so that I could hunt. The hunt rolls around once a year, and I can't find it every year. And even if I could, the prize is only ten grand. So I got to do something else with my time. I have to go into each and every hunt thinking this is going to be my last chance. You know, I hear everybody say, there's always next year, there's always next year. What if there's not a next year? I wouldn't be terribly surprised that if in my lifetime, the hunt is ended. You know, I mean, there's a lot of destruction to the parks. There's no doubt in my mind that someday I will turn this thing over. And the only question is when and where. I will probably be a two-time finder. Well, we extended an invitation to Steve, the map guy, but unfortunately he was unable to make it today. He uh, did have a work commitment, so uh, we're unfortunate that we couldn't uh, interview him. But Jake Ingebretson, the person who said that he wanted to find the medallion twice, well, he's here with us. Jake, welcome to North Star Oasis. Thank Thanks for coming out today. Thanks for having me. So I, I previewed with, with Jake. I told him, right as the show began, I'm going to ask you one personal question. It's the same one I ask every guest. Okay. There are 305 shopping days left until Christmas. When you were a little boy and somebody asked you, or actually, when you were a little boy, what was your favorite Christmas present? What was my favorite Christmas present? Of all present? time. Of all time? Yeah. I got a Cabbage Patch Kid astronaut. It's the best Christmas <laughs> present I ever got. What year was that? It would have been 1986. How old were you? Seven. Congratulations. Do you still have it? Uh, somewhere, yes. Somewhere, yes. I uh, like that answer. So, you uh, won the, uh, or won, you found the medallion in 2007. Uh, tell us about that experience. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, to kind of backtrack a little bit. Um, the name Rob Brass is going to come into our conversations quite a bit today. Um, and that day in 2007 was the first time that I had ever met Rob Brass. Um, to back up even before that day, um, I was convinced throughout 2006 that the medallion was going to be at Hidden Falls. I mean, I was all in on it coming up to the 2007 treasure hunt to the point where my wife, a girlfriend at the time, now wife, um, whenever we'd go for walks, we'd well, let's go to Hidden Falls. Let's go to Hidden Falls. And by the time that hunt rolled around, I knew the north end of the park better than anybody. And in fact, the first clue, second clue, I was down on the north end all day. And uh, after the third clue, I get there about 11, 1130-ish in the morning, and uh, there's a guy dressed, dressed in neat, neat clothes, um, looked like he had come from work, and he's reading Steve's book, looking at Steve's book. And uh, we kind of started chatting, and uh, it was Rob Brass, and I had never met him before. And uh, we started talking about the clues a little bit, and he says, well, I'll tell you what the, I think the third clue means. And the key to it was really the last line, vagueness rules, and that's on the level. Well, he explained to me the word level is in Cleveland, as in Cleveland Avenue, which intersected the park on the south end of the park. And uh, I kind of shrugged my shoulders, oh, yeah, that sounds good, you know. But in my head, I'm thinking, based on how the clue was worded, and I, I can tell you the whole clue, it was, uh, hunters can be surly, but in, or in hunt time it's early, and hunters can be surly. And in the hunt, be safe and revel. Near land that is high, the treasure is nigh. 
vagueness rules, and that's on the level. That clue told you exactly where the medallion was, if you figured it out, which Rob did. And hmm. Rob told me, and uh, I actually had lunch with Rob today, and I asked him, you know, did you know that that's, that was telling you exactly where it was? He kind of said he suspected it might, but it was for sure telling you it was at Hidden Falls. Um, and I immediately knew that after Rob told me that, I'm like, this is the best chance I'm ever going to have at finding the medallion. So I shook Rob's hand. He had to go back to work for a little bit. And uh, I drove up, and I, there's, a stop, there's a stop sign, a three-way stop on Mississippi River Boulevard where Cleveland Avenue intersects. And there's a rail, like just an old brass railing there. And I, wa I actually stopped my car, left it running at the stop sign, left my door open. I ran up there, and I looked down. And it was just a wooded area, and I kind of decided... I'd, I'd been banking they were going to put it in a wooded area because it was what they had done a, few, a couple of years before. Okay. And I said, I need to bank on this being in a block ice. They, they had done it in 2003, and uh, it just kind of was stuck in my head. It's going to be an ice because there was maybe two inches of snow on the ground. So um, the very first spot I went, ironically, was, was referenced in the last clue but it paced you off. I was 40, 45 paces away from it when I started looking. I'd spent about an hour there. It was this giant, behead, like this giant rotted out stump. Like it was probably 10, 15 feet tall. And there were three branches that went out. I could still see it so clearly. And uh, then you had to go, there was a hill, little hillside that went down, maybe 10, 15 feet. And there were a bunch of fall, little fallen down trees, but I couldn't see any of them. In the, but the one I could see off in the distance was exactly where the medallion was. Oh, wow. So I go down and I walk by all these other fallen down trees and I kind of start walking up to the spot and I see footprints. And the footprints stopped about five or six feet short. There were two fairly small logs that were kind of crossed like an X. And uh, my thought was, well, what, what, what are these footprints? X marks here? the spot? Well, <laughs> and the footprints kind of looked like they were, had kind of washed, like somebody was kind of trying to maneuver. It, and then they and I looked over the log. I just looked quick, and there were, the footprints didn't keep going. They stopped there. And the next thing I know, I'm on my knees, and there were there were leaves along along the edge of the of, of the logs. And I just brushed it aside. The next thing I know, I have this block of ice in my hand. It was perfectly square. And the side that I looked at first had this little card, probably three inches by an inch and a quarter, with the Ford logo on it. And it was frozen in the ice. And I go, and I thought to myself, what is the Ford logo? And all of a sudden, it hit me that I had it. And I flipped it over and it had the United Auto Workers logo from the Ford plant because they had just announced the Ford plant was closing. Ah. And the Ford plant was right there by Hidden Falls. And at that moment I realized I had it. And it was the most unbelievable, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. And So we played the Prager segment today about happiness. Yeah. How happy were you when you got that medallion and you recognized what you had? Well, I mean, and ask anybody that knew me up prior to that point that, I mean, I wanted to find it so bad. I mean, I more or less dedicated my life to it for the seven and a half years. I was, I was going to ask, when, when did you start? 1999 was my first time. What made you decide to start taking it seriously? Um, well, it was how frustratingly close I got in 1999. A uh, guy I worked with at the time, we were sitting in the break room at work, and he's read, he read one, he was like, I think it was a third clue, and it referenced the, the duplex he lived in. And it was, it was at Conway Park, and he lived in the basement of this house. And he's like, I think this is across the street from my house at the park. And we went out after work, and we were the only ones in the park. All the snow is fresh. And five days later, the park is packed, the snow is pulverized, and uh, the rest is kind of history there. Uh, 1999, um, in the interest of full disclosure, I was actually working at the Pioneer Press at that time. I had worked in, uh, as a typist in classified advertising. Uh, and so once I had started at the Pioneer Press, my winter carnival medallion hunt days, they went down to nothing because I was forbidden from even looking. Uh, simply because I was a Pioneer Press employee, and the last thing they, they want is a Pioneer Press employee to find the medallion because then that would make the paper look 
look really bad and people would think that there would be an unfair advantage even though those of us who were employees were just as clueless as uh, everybody else because they they kept it so tight-lipped that very very few people knew what was going on so I had backed out I would I'd never taken the medallion hunt that seriously I had gone out I actually did have one close call uh, went out to Goodrich Park one day. I thought that that was where the clues were all, uh, and it was there that year. I can't remember what it's year never this been was. never Goodrich, by the way. Was it Goodrich? Where would it have been? What year? Do you remember? Uh, this would have been like 93 or 94. Well, at 93, it would have been Hidden Falls, too. Okay. And then 94 would have been Highland. Yeah, it was Highland. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I had walked by, but I missed it by like 20 feet. Okay. And, you know, I had a... I had a tip from a serious hunter who you know, wanted me to go out there with him, and then he went out, then I went out later, and then he went out afterwards, and he didn't get it that year, but we were both close. We, we were both within 15 to 20 feet of yeah. it. Somebody else got it about three or four days later. Yeah. So you know, that, that was the apex of my uh, medallion finding. I have long since left the Pioneer Press, but after having deployed in the Middle East over four winters, uh, I, the cold just doesn't, I, I don't hold up as well as I used to. Mm -hmm. So there was the year at Conway Park, 99. What happened after that? Uh, I just kind of made the decision. I remember uh, we were at the park and all of a sudden cops came by, said it was found. Park cleared out and I just decided I want to find the medallion. I just, I had so much fun. I, I had worked so hard at it. I didn't want all that hard work to be for naught. You know, I wanted, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to make something of it. You know, I, I kind of, you know, I have the type of personality where I can't, st I can't start something and just kind of do it half-assed. I gotta, you know, I either gotta do it not at all or 100 percent. So, um, yeah, and that that kind of started the snowball, and it's been rolling down the hill ever since. No, oh, and then 18 years or 19 years later, and speaking of 19 years later, we're gonna take a look at the Pioneer Press hiding the 2018 treasure hunt medallion. So that's the 2018 when they hid the medallion, but you wanted to wrap up something with 2007. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I did want to say too that it was really early in the hunt and that uh, there's no one else even looking in the park when I found it. Um, and so I, I started to run and I realized I wanted to be able to find, remember where I found it, so I dropped my gloves and my shovel. And I had almost a mile walk to my car because the south gate at Hidden Falls at the time was closed and you had to walk down this giant hill and then back up it um, underneath the Highway 5 bridge there. I'm sure some people okay. will be familiar with that. But that walk was, it probably took me 20, 25 minutes. And kind of a funny anecdote to that, the only two people I saw from the time I found it to the time I got to my car are these two cross-country skiers. And I was screaming. And I was holding the, the block ice in my jacket pocket, and I was just screaming. And the lady goes, are you okay? And I'm like, I just found the medallion. And she goes, yeah, right. And they just kept skiing down. <laughs> and I've always wondered what, the, what, what those cross-country skiers thought when they saw in the news or the newspaper, or however they saw it, that uh, it, it actually was found. I've well, always... I'll tell you my 1999 treasure hunt story. Or, yeah, uh, not, not 99, 2007. You know, 2007... I'm sitting here reading the paper, and you know I still had friends at the Pioneer Press. They're like, "Oh yeah, medallion's been found. Three days. What? <laughs> no way!" And sure enough, um, you found it in three clues. Yep, that was that was kind of the the, the reaction across the board. I mean, um, you know, my brother had actually I had just gotten back to my apartment, and fortunately, I got a couple pictures of the block of ice before I thawed it out, and. I was telling my brother, I found it. He's like, what did you find it? I'm like, well, it's still frozen in a block of ice. He's like, oh, you don't have it. You just found a chunk of ice. So with my brother on the phone, I held the block of ice in my hand and turned on the hot water in my faucet and watched it melt, and the medallion just fell right in my hand. So I'm like, oh, I got it. I said, get over to my apartment. We, had li we were living downtown St. Paul the, at the time, and the Pioneer Press sent over a reporter, John Brewer, um, to do the story because I, I told him I wasn't turning it in right away, and I kind of rubbed them the wrong way but uh so he came over and and you know the the one thing that i'm really glad i did too is i i had tracked down rob brass and i brought him in to turn it in with me because i really felt that he deserved some of the credit and um so you know, there is there is an honor amongst treasure well, hunters i i can't say amongst treasure hunters but i i've always I always try to do the right thing in my life, and I thought it was definitely the right thing to do. Because bottom line, I wouldn't have found it had he not told me. Yeah. Or at least I wouldn't have found it that day. Yeah. So, and I thought, you know, giving him credit was the right thing to do. And so. All right, now here's what I want to do. I want to take a look at this year's. Now, I know you went out hunting this year. Oh, yeah. You know the clues. This is the first time I've looked at the clues. So what I want to know from you, we, and they, they, they give the, exp, the official explanation. I want to know what you, when I'm going to read a clue, and then I want to hear your interpretation of what that would mean, you know. Based on where it based was? Based on, on where it was and if, okay. you know, what you were thinking. So clue number one, coming here from far and near, a million will descend to lure football here for, to lure footfall here for football, our carnival we shall extend. We hope this year to yield the team cheer for the home team in the hull. Like Norse of old, will we be so bold to drink from the loser's skull. Our own Super Bowl need not exact a toll of the vanquished quite so drastic, but go on a lark in an area park and the reward could be fantastic. So what does that say to you when, when you first read this? Well, when I first read it, um, the two things that you take out of it, now you want this in hindsight, correct? I want it in hindsight, but I also kind of want to know what you were looking at before you, you knew where it was and what the explanation was. Well, there were two things. Before, before it was found, the two things I was looking at there were, first of all, in an area park. Area is regional to me. It was in a regional park. Yeah. And there were a lot of people that... And, and it seems that, that that's like always the first clue is it's in a park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of people were... Sweet Hollow was on a lot of people's radar for a long time this year. Um, I just never liked it just because of that word area. I, I was convinced that it was in a regional park, and if it was at Sweet Hollow, I was just going to be wrong and not get there, really. So, um, And the other thing is drink from a loser's skull. There was a, there was a boat at the Yacht Club on the east side of the park that had the skull and crossbones flag up. Okay. So, and that was one of those things you never would have known. But the key to that clue um, was, was the Vikings chant, what, the team cheer, you know, the skull. Yes. Skull. Well, the last time it was at Harriet Island, the medallion was in a skull tin. Okay. So, 
you know, you could have probably figured out Harriet Island had you interpreted that correctly, but. But again, it's so vague that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. their explanation from the Pioneer Press. The first stanza talks about how the Winter Carnival has been extended to coincide with the Super Bowl festivities. In the second stanza, we invoke the team cheer or skull. The last time the medallion found at Harriet Island, 1996, it was hidden in a can of skull chewing tobacco. By legend, skull refers to the Viking practice of drinking from the skull of their enemy after a victory. Hull refers to the inside of the ship-shaped Viking stadium, but it also alludes to the boatyard by Harriet Island. Also, the medallion is hidden within a repurposed beer koozie with a football theme. The third stanza invokes our own Super Bowl, the treasure hunt. So clue number two, which is a lot smaller than the first one. To make your mark, you may want to park while searching within the county. It means a lot to end this plot by digging up glorious bounty. Um, you know, once we got to Harriet Island, the thought of that was make your mark. Uh, was the target stage there. Um, and then, the, but in hindsight, the words park, lot, and plot was right in the middle of a parking lot. So, yeah, and their explanation is park, lot, and end indicate the medallion is hidden at the end of a parking lot. Digging up indicates it is buried in the snow and must be dug out. Clue number three, our last big game finished the same as the others before it. You're no glib ghoul, so don't play the fool. Follow something knobbly to score it. Um, I had this clue pretty well figured out once I got to Harriet Island. Um, and when did you get to Harriet Island? Uh, I was there Saturday morning, the morning after clue seven. Okay. I was the only one in the park. I, not another person. Um, <laughs> but people were, and all the, all the veteran hunters were starting to show up through the day. Um, and it was pretty much just, it was mostly people I knew that Saturday. And then Sunday there were a lot more. So um, that clue is an awesome Awesome, awesome clue. They're referring to the Super Bowl. The last Super Bowl the Vikings played in was in 1977. That was our last big game, finished the same as the others before it. Glibgul is an anagram for Bill Gah. Bill Gah, go Gah, I'm not sure how to pronounce yep. it. I'll, I'll read the explanation here. Uh, yeah. The Minnesota Vikings have been to the Super Bowl four times, the last in 1977, and we lost each time. But hunters want to win, like 1977 finder Bill Goga, uh, G-O-U-G-H, anagram by Glibgoal, uh, did in Irvine Park. With Irvine Park as a reference point, we recommend following something knobbly like a Walnut Street. Uh, which marks a straight line to Harriet Island. Irvine, Irvine Park has a strong connection to Harriet Island through Justice Oage, who mortgaged his home on Irvine Park to buy Harriet Island, which he later gave to the city. The lore is that the city fixed up Irvine Park to show Oage that they would be proper stewards of Harriet Island. Oage suggested the island be named after Harriet Bishop, the St. Paul educator. So that was their official explanation. Um, what were you looking at when when you know, be before you knew it was Harriet Island? Um, well, I, th I thought that that something knobbly was going to be important. Um, and a lot of people were at Crosby before Harriet Island, and a lot of people thought it was pilot in reference to Pilot Knob Road. So, um, you know. And that, it was that, Walnut Street. Yep, yep. So. Okay, clue number four. Look, down, look from the tower down to the bower where grasses grow so green. Come to the ledge, then make a pledge to collect a reward far from mean. Here's their explanation. From the towers of downtown St. Paul, you can see the bower of Harriet Island, including the green grass of the Ohage Green La Great Lawn. For those who guessed the Highland Water Tower, you were halfway there. The tower was designed by Clarence Cap Wigington, who designed the pavilion named after him on Harriet Island. That explanation is garbage. They're talking about the Ice Palace. You can see the Ice Palace from one little spot at Harriet Island had a flag right on the top of the tower. So I, I hate that clue. I hate that explanation. As You're calling it like you see yeah, it. I, I like mean, that. I, you know. Okay. Clue number five. Actually, we're going to take a quick break on this because we're going to show you a video with uh, Santa Dave. Because as we talk about you searching, let's take a look at what of the other uh, medallion hunters use for their searches. I first got into it because I thought, well, here's a chance to find some money. What would I do with the $10,000? I think I'd spend most of it on wild women and just blow the rest. I'm well known for micro-napping. I can fall asleep anywhere. I used to deliver pizza. I delivered for 26 years. Well, I never knew yeah. Santa worked at the pizza factory. 
<laughs> Santa has to have different jobs for different uh, seasons. So that was my job. I got all my treasure hunting stuff in the car. There's a couple of computers in there and uh, Tostitos. This is my folding chair, my uh, propane heater. This is what I use during the hunt. You go down to the Pioneer Press uh, every night at 11 o'clock to get the clues and you have to stand in line and this would keep me warm. Oh God, I got so much stuff here. This shovel is almost a new shovel. Three years ago when I was at Conway Park, I left my shovel outside and went inside to go to the bathroom when, when I came back my shovel was gone. So I had to make a mad dash to the hardware store. This is my long sleeve flannel shirt along with this uh, matching hat. See I believe in fashion and you should have matching clothes. A little WD-40. Every guy needs a can of WD-40 for something. Santa has to wrap uh, presents in something. Santa gloves. Here's my Santa suit. The loaf of bread. There's some priority mail boxes. Sometimes Santa has to send stuff all over the world. I keep a lot of stuff in my car. <laughs> now it looks like some people are saying that it might be at Como. $10,000 shall be mine. This is our seventh park of the night. We got three inches of snow this morning, I think it was. I mean, we got a couple of feet to deal with. Those clues could fit different places, so we're just kind of checking out the area. I've been through the Capitol, I've been through Fallon Park, Killer Park. They ain't over there. This is the closest clue right here. I was looking yesterday, still back over at uh, Marydale, which is down here. The clues really do still all fit there, but this last one just doesn't say yes, it's there. It kind of leaves you hanging. This is the West Picnic Ground. I, I just can't figure out that man of steel and plenty of metal. Picking up a long shot theory. One of the best long shot theories though around. Relieving stress as we drove around all Still day. Still don't know what park or a lot of public land this thing is in though. No. I'm gonna go try and figure something out. Have some kind of revelation. So. Once we find it, we're going off base. We're gonna dig it up literally. We're gonna take it out of the ground, smash the ground up. We're gonna do everything to find that medallion. Matt, stop digging there. Right in this circle. That's a hundred percent. Be a zoo tomorrow, probably. Or... Well, you know, I think we're right on top of it. My brother was real close last year. Him and his girlfriend were out at Newell Park, and they were looking around. She was getting tired, and she says, "Oh, I want to sit down. My feet are cold." And she was going to go over to a swing and sit down. And he says, "No, we got to keep looking. It's here. It's here. You know." Well, the swing she was going to sit on, that's where the medallion was, right underneath the swing. Oh like that. I think everyone who's ever hunted has a story about how close they are, whether or not it's um, a little bit fabricated or not. What anyone... keeps everybody coming back is how close we got one time. 50 feet away. Within 50 feet. About 50 feet or so. 25 yards Within away. 15 feet of it. Five feet Within away. 15 feet. 23 steps. Six feet away from it. 10 me. feet from it. Three feet away last They're Within year. 20 or 30 yards. One year, my sister was sitting on a rock, resting. She got up from a rock and a guy came along and looked underneath the rock and found a medallion. I have a feeling that when it was at Conway that we actually did dig it up. I really believe that at Conway I had the thing in my shovel at one time or another. I had to go to work that afternoon and there's only one other person digging by that park bench. That person found it that afternoon. It was about three feet short of where we stopped. Had we kept digging for another two, three minutes, I think we'd have found it. So he's sitting down in the snow, you know, just taking a breather. His butt print was right next to the spot where they found the medallion. He could have reached down into the snow and become $10,000 richer. At one point, you're going to get close to it. You realize that you don't find it every third year, because <laughs> just because you're close. We think it's cold. Here, Phelan or Battle Creek, maybe, but I don't think it's at Battle I don't, Creek. We don't think it's at Battle Creek. I still think it's at Battle Creek. Don't think it's at Como. There's just way too much going on there. Pioneer Press would have a lot more to lose than they would to gain putting the medallion at Como. If it were at Como, they would have told us by now. Como is the king of St. Paul Parks and a lot of snow to turn over. Two. Thanks. Memory lane, we need hardly explain. It's the busiest street of all. Think of traveling the old way again. And you might make a big haul. It's the pony ride at Como. Okay, you're going to the park then. Okay, we're gonna to go to Marydale. Is there a trolley car at Como? Yeah. I got a feeling we're gonna be standing out here for a few more nights yet. Uh, another vague clue. Where are you? In the woods digging, you know, like. 
So, uh, another vag clue. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you knew a, a lot of the guys who were in there. Keep in mind that this footage is like 15 years old. So yeah, a, lot lot of that, a lot of that's, most of that, 2001, actually. So, so a lot 17. of that's 2001. So well, that's 17 years. I mean, that the kid who was like 12 years old is now 30. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about Santa Dave real quick. Um, he was... A, <laughs> one of the most interesting characters I've ever met. Um, nice guy, very funny. Um, there were a lot of things about him that, I mean, they probably have a lot of footage of him that they just couldn't use because it was so vulgar. Oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, and sadly, uh, I was having dinner with Santa Dave. It's kind of a long story, but long story short, he just collapsed in my lap and died. Wow. Literally what, fell right in my lap. What year was that? Uh, that would have been May of 2007. Okay. Just a few months after... I found it the first time. So, so now tell me about the uh, frustration, or you know, any other close calls that you may have had. Well, fail in two thousand four. <coughs> um, if uh, if the animal wouldn't have ate the donut, moved the medallion. Probably me, map guy, and there was a kid named Tim Petrie. The three of us uh, were digging right where it was, hidden originally. And I'm pretty sure that one of us four would have found it had had it not been moved. Um, we were at fail on Saturday morning. Again, all the snow was fresh. There were just a couple dozen people there, maybe. And uh, also, um, in 2015, the, when the map guy, Steve Worthman, he actually found it uh, a few years ago. Um, it was just laying on the ground. And me, Steve, Rob Brass, of course, and a kid named Steven Safner, who was a part of group, the group that found it this year with Rob Brass, uh, any one of us could have found it. Steve, Steve happened to come across it, and uh, I mean that was, you know, that was a close one too. So I, I, and I have to say, I mean, I'm one of two people in the history of the hunt that's actually dug it out of the snow twice. I mean, how can I? And I was going to bring that up uh, after we finished the clues, but you know, you you won the, you know, you found it twice. Uh, let's go back to the clues because okay. we're gonna, we're, we're going to skip through a lot of the clues uh, for this year, but there's going to be two that we're going to focus on uh, before we end here. Uh, clue number seven: accept our apology for this anthology of our republic's justice and laws, but once destroyed, it got redeployed to ser re to serve our refreshment and pause. Now, their official explanation, the anthology is of works by Plato, such as Apology, Republic, Laws, and Justice. Plato Boulevard runs along the edge of Harriet Island Park. The Republic's Justice and Laws also refers to the old city hall and courthouse in St. Paul, which was torn down in 1933. The Casota Stone from the demolition was used in, the building, of, in building the pavilion on Harriet Island. Justice also alludes to Justice Ohage, the man who gave Harriet Island to the city in and for whom one of its streets is named. So what did Clue 7 tell you? Because it uh, seems that you were going to Harriet Island right around that time. That, that's the clue that got us to Harriet Island. And um, I remember a guy, Kid Alex, called me and said, it's on Harriet Island, it's on Harriet Island, uh, when the clue came out. And I said, well, let's, let's stop. Let's start backtracking and get talk about some of the other clues and how they might fit Harriet. And we got it to work. So um, that next morning, I went to Harriet Island and never left. So... Okay, and we're going to show you one more clip here on the frustration of the treasure hunt. In the woods digging, you know, like the clue said, down, go your 50 paces down. I hadn't seen the guy at all. There were about 50 of us here all night. And then next thing I know, some guy walks up, kicks some snow right by the sign, totally away from where the clue says to go, and finds it. And to my knowledge, he had been here for five minutes. A lot of people are very, very suspicious of what's happened here this morning. The mystery is why it was found there. The clues didn't match up. The last clue did not bring you here. I find it impossible. It got kicked all the way up the hill. That thing was moved 100 feet. It's, it's over the hill. It had to be carried. Somebody could have found it over there and fell out of their pocket. He didn't even know what it was. Yeah. He was like, oh, he what's this? What's what this? And it took him 10 minutes to find out what it was. How does it just all of a sudden get found out in the middle of the wide open after thousands of people have been through this area since Saturday? Someone from the paper came down here last night and dropped it. 10 minutes before it was found, they dropped it. And it was not found in a green donut. A crow took the donut to the top of the pine trees, ate it, and fell out. Because that's the only other way it could have got here. I've had it. I've had it. Those people have no integrity. Pretty crazy. One of the more unusual. This one will go down in the books.
for We've your never been kicked out of a press conference before, have we? Why, why were we kicked out of the building? Is why, why weren't we welcome to the press conference? What was the explanation? Yeah. Carolyn told me we, that they got a phone call see, are, are you uh, gonna, saying that somebody had planned to disrupt the oh, news yeah, conference. I, we're the cooler crew. We've been in there. Th that, that guy, he's one of us. He's a hunter. We're here to congratulate him, no matter what we feel about the Pioneer Press. I feel kind of bad. <laughs> Sorry. There's no way 1,400 people walked over that hill last night and didn't kick it up. He walked right to it this morning. Don't think it happened. It was kind of sitting right on top of the snow. So it's sitting on top of the snow? Kind of, yeah. You, you, could, you could see a part of it. I wasn't sure either. Just the lady, and she did the probably some animal lady. They put it in a donut in the woods. Oh. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen to a real donut in the woods? Uh, an animal's going to get it. I mean, it's obvious. Either an animal got a hold of it and spit it out where it wasn't supposed to be, or they realized their mistake, an animal actually ate it, and they just came and dropped another one the next morning. So I don't know how the hell we missed it. I wasn't drinking at 6.30 in the morning. I guess we'll never know for sure what happened. But, you know, of course we can sit here and guess all day long. We take off work. We lie to our employers. Uh, we, our spouses don't matter. You know, nothing matters but the hunt. Ladies will come out in skirts if it's lunchtime and maybe high heels and a uh, windshield scraper. It's like the big California gold rush. Watch out yeah. for your toes because somebody will pick them to death. Yeah. It's like taking a two-week vacation in your hometown. There are uh, spotters out there just making sure nobody picks it up, goes home, and sleeps on it for a week. I dreamt that I found the medallion in a salad that I was eating. <laughs> everybody had a plan. <laughs> Nobody's plan worked. I'm just lost like everybody else. It's like one of the conspiracy. It's like, okay, who writes the clues and, and when is it hidden? The identity of the clue writer is the best kept secret in St. Paul. I think clue writer's been a female because clues are very vague. They tend to not go directly to the spot, but kind of dance around the issue. They bring up things that you thought were long ago forgotten, and yet they somehow expect you to know exactly what they're talking about. We bring Coleman lanterns, and we wear snake lights around our necks so our hands are free to dig. It gets into your blood, and you really, it's like a disease. Either I'm dedicated or I'm crazy. Would you open a dirty diaper? I would. What if I never find this thing? I think I'm going to die. Never finding them down. Just to find it for once, that's my goal in life. Where else would you find people, you know, in 20 degree below zero weather? And I've seen them out there digging holes in the snow looking for this little plastic thing that's going to get them $5,000 or $10,000. There's a little more to it than just some crazy people running out looking in, in the snow for, for an impossible treasure to find. So, frustrations? Yeah, that 2004 hunt was... That, that was the one, that was literally since 1999, there's been one day where I've really wondered if I'd ever find the medallion, and it was that morning. Um, that was just so incredibly frustrating. Guy, you know, guy didn't even know what it was. He picks it up, and I was standing 20 feet away from him, and I saw him pick it up, and I saw the blue plastic, and I was like, he just found it. I couldn't believe it. I wow. still can't. I mean, it was such a bizarre, such a bizarre ending. Okay, so now clue 11 from this year. Do not panic and run off manic. Cut your reverie short. and route to yachters between two waters. Keep the landlubbers to port. Explanation from the Pioneer Press. Run off manic refers to hunter's excitement when they get to a park and go off to search. This year, since the medallion was in a parking lot snowbank, we encouraged folks to cut their wild frolic short. The park is surrounded by slips and marinas, so the third line is meant to give some bearings. If you're between the waters of the Mississippi and Water Street, keep the west side on your left and head towards the St. Paul Yacht Club. Yeah. Um, when that clue came out, it was really confusing. Um, you know, there was a lot of debate amongst hunters. Most thought it was going to be on the west end of the park, but there were a few of us, myself included, that thought it was going to be east, and I was wrong, and uh, so yeah. <laughs> and you admit it at least. Yeah, yeah, no, I ate. You know what? And I'll even admit, I'll go as far as say the last five years I've been really lazy, haven't been doing the work when the hunt isn't going on to prepare. And uh, nobody will be more prepared for the 2019 treasure hunt than I. I will guarantee Is it going to be you or Rob Brass? It'll be me. <laughs> and Rob will probably say he begs to differ? Well... Yeah. Rob, yeah, yeah, Rob won't say much. He'll, <laughs> uh, he, he's too humble sometimes. <clears throat> 
So uh, Rob Brass did find it, and let's take a look here at the video from which you, you inform me is kind of rare that you never actually see. Oh no, this is the this this video is the closest it's that the medallion's ever come to actually being on film being found. This starts within seconds of it actually being uncovered, within seconds. And I, I'm kind of a history junkie when it comes to the treasure hunt. So I, th and I think 20 years from now, it's going to be more incredible than it is now. All right, let's take a look at when Rob Brass found the 2018 medallion. So that's what it looks like to win. Is that? Uh, tell me briefly about your uh, your second experience, 2010. Uh, just quickly, uh, Rob and I had decided to team up. It was after the 11th clue. It was the last day of the hunt, and the 11th clue had mentioned it's 48 paces from the water line, and the, the area looked like a bomb had gone off. Except there was a path about a foot wide. It was all ice. I mean, it was two, 18 inches of ice for sure, and. Uh, it had also mentioned a tangle near the river, and there was a fallen down tree with a root system up. So everything was right there, and I told Rob, we need to, we need to start chipping at this ice because it's probably under this path. But the path was long enough where it was going to be hard. So we each started on the side of the tree. I broke my hole right away, had to walk a quarter mile back to my car. We came back, and I was just chipping away, and I was trying to turn over big chunks of ice, and I turned over this big chunk of ice like two minutes after I'd gotten back. And the medallion was in the ice at an angle, and I just maybe saw the top half inch of it, and I knew I had it. And I don't remember chipping it out, but I put a bunch of chips actually in the plastic of the medallion because I was so jacked up, and I just yelled, yes, yes, I'm a two-time finder, yes. And Rob, Rob jumped over the, the, tree, the fallen down tree and almost fell flat on his face. I remember he kind of stumbled, and yep, into, into treasure hunt history we went. And then, uh, you know, he won it again this year. Uh, yep. where, where were you when he won it? Um, there, the, most of the people were in the parking lot by the stage, around the parking lot by the stage, because a scramble clue had come out and said, you know, it had mentioned Ohage stage and far away. So it was near, near the stage, far from Ohage, or near Ohage, far from the stage. We didn't know which one. Most people went near the stage. Um, but I was wrong. So where were you? I was by the stage. Most okay. pe most people were. All right. Ninety five percent of the people were where I was. Okay, and then of course the clips that we had saw we had shown you came from a documentary. You wanna yep. in fifteen seconds? Uh, it's called No Time for Cold Feet. Available on DVD on uh, eBay. Uh, if you're into the treasure hunt, you gotta see it. There is a forty five minute interview in the extras with former clue writers. All right, and with that. Thank you for uh, coming. We Thank appreciate you. having you. And then we're going to leave you with Winter Wonderland from Pershing's own U.S. Army Band. Dallas Pearson producer. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you there's 305 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.